This is 1.6, day eight. I am Mr. Bishop, and today we're gonna to be fitting linear functions to data. Uh, they're actually guided, as you can see, so I passed these out in class today. If you don't have a copy of this or you lost yours, um, I also posted a blank copy online as well. So in addition to these guided notes, uh, if you, unless you just wanna write it down in a notebook, uh, you'll also need your calculator, in particular a graphing calculator, so you learn this skill. So let's go ahead and start with example one here, jump right in with an example. It says the table below shows data for 12 students in a pre-calc class. It's track and field day apparently. Each member of the class ran a 40 yard sprint and they did a long jump with a running start. Make a scatter plot of the relationship between sprint time in seconds and long jump distance in inches. And here we've got the data for each one of the 12 students. So a scatter plot means we keep one variable in the x-axis, one variable in the y-axis, and then we can use these as coordinate points and make dots. So the first thing we need to do in our calculator is enter this data. So to do that, we're gonna go to stat and then edit, and that's where we can enter the data, and I'll show you on my calculator too. So generally we throw the x values into L1 X values being the independent variable and the Y values into L2. So for our purposes, the X value, that's gonna be the sprint time on top here. And then the Y values, long jump distance right there. So I've got my calculator here. I'm gonna go to stat. There's the stat button in red. And then edit's the first option. So I just have to hit enter. And then in L1, I'm gonna go ahead and list out all those sprint times. That's gonna be our X variable, 5.401, 5.05 so on and so forth. All right, there we go. You can go ahead and pause the video and enter them for yourself. Uh, you should have 12 entries once you get all the sprint times entered. Just check and make sure each one's right. And now let's go ahead and enter the long jump distance. So I'm gonna arrow right over to L2 here. And then I start with 171, 184. And go ahead, you can pause the video. Let's get these all entered here for the long jump distances in L2. All right, there we go. I've got everything entered in L1, everything entered in L2, hopefully all correct. Uh, let's go back to the notes here. So how do we make that scatter plot show up on our calculator? Well, how do we make the graph? I want you to hit second, y equals, and above it, that's the stat plot command. And I want you to turn plot one on. So what does that look like here? Let's go second in the y equals button up top. It says stat plot, that's actually what we're interested in. And then we want to turn plot one on. So hit enter, turn that thing on. And the fact that it's got this dot plot little graph here, that means it's going to make a scatter plot, not a histogram or a box plot. Ours is actually going to make a scatter plot, uh, and it's going to use L1 and L2. So whatever list you enter those in, hopefully L1 and L2, that's the list you're going to use uh, for our scatter plot. Great, so we've got it on. If we go ahead and hit, go ahead and hit graph over here, Wow, I can't see anything. I just have this 10 by 10 window. And it kind of makes sense that I can't see anything at this point because those points that I graph, none of them would fall within a 10 by 10 window. For example, the smallest Y value was 65. So it should make sense that I don't see anything at this point. I've got to adjust my window somehow. So here's the most efficient and effective way to actually get your scatter plot to show up in your graph. Hit graph. After you graph it, the graph button, we did that. Go to zoom and then hit the ninth one, zoom stat. That means it's gonna focus on your statistics, which is this data right here. So zoom and then zoom nine. All right, that's the zoom stat option. Let's focus there. So I've already hit graph, I can't see anything, but I'm gonna to go to zoom right there in the middle. And then if I arrow down to the ninth one, or if you just press the number nine, it'll work for you, zoom nine, there it is. Zoom stat, it's gonna zoom in on my statistics, beautiful. There's my scatter plot in all its glory. Awesome. So we're actually going to use this to provide a rough sketch of the scatter plot. Uh, what are the actual points at here? Here's another little hint. If you just hit trace right there, the trace button, it'll give you, it'll see a highlight, it'll highlight any of the points. You can just arrow right or left and it'll highlight the actual points. And you should recognize those as being the points from your table. Okay, when we start thinking about fitting a line to these data, you should kind of see where a line might fit right through these points. Right? So you should start to see a linear trend here. Uh, and it should make sense that the slope is negative, right? The slower your sprint time, probably the less that you're going to be able to long jump. 
right? And that's not the case for everybody. There's some outliers here and some exceptions to that rule. But in general, the slower your sprint time, right, you're closer to 7.5 seconds instead of five, generally you just don't go as far in the long jump. So how do we calculate the equation of that best fit line, the regression line that's gonna go right through there? Well, on our calculator, we'll go to stat, calc, and then the fourth option is lin reg. So stat, calc, lin reg. At least for right now, it'll go ahead and calculate it for us. So let's hit calculate, lin reg. There's your linear equation. Ax plus b, I know we usually say mx, that's okay. A is our slope, b is our y-intercept, bingo, there we go. So I'm not gonna keep all those decimal places, but let's go ahead and write that equation here. Y equals negative 45.74x plus 414.79. Two decimal places, I think that's pretty sufficient for this one. So what does this tell us, this line? Well, x, we said that was the sprint time, right? So in theory, if you tell me somebody's sprint time, let's say it's between five and 7.5, my line is gonna make a prediction for their long jump distance, so I kinda map that out here. You tell me somebody's sprint time, my line will make a prediction about their long jump distance. Okay, then the last piece we have to do here is graph this line in our calculator. So technically you could just go to y equals and type this in for y1. If you'd like that really, really exact line with all the decimal points, I'll show you another way. Uh, you go to y equals, like you're gonna graph a line, uh, and then you hit vars, there's a vars button on your calculator, and then we want the fifth option, which is stat, and then we want EQ, which stands for equation. So we want our stats equation. Let's try that. So I'm gonna go to Y equals, and then the VARS button right here, and the fifth one down, let's go to stats, and then I want EQ, so let's arrow over a couple, and that very first one, let's hit enter. Reg EQ, that stands for regression equation. Wow, it just took all those decimal places and put it in there for us, it gave us our line. Go ahead and go back to our graph screen, hit graph again, wow, oh man. Right through the middle, perfect. Again, you don't have to follow that for this one, if you just wanna graph the one that we wrote down on our paper, that's gonna to work too. In fact, you probably would not be able to notice the difference uh, as far as how precise it is with the pixels on your calculator. Right, I'm just gonna scroll down here. Part C says interpret the slope and each intercept that implies that there's more than one intercept, right? There could be an x-intercept and a y-intercept. Let's start with the slope. So we've got the slope being negative 45.74. And we can think about it as that just being negative 45.74 over 1. That kind of helps our interpretation. Because then we get to go with the units. So on bottom, our x variable was seconds, right? So on bottom, we have one second. And on top, the units would be inches in the long jump. Remember how we read this. Uh, for each additional second, a person is slow in the run, we could say, we would predict that they would lose about 45.74 inches in their long jump. And that's not a hard, fast rule. Again, you've got people that are exceptions to that rule. So I'm just going to say that's a prediction, right? That's just on average. Let's start with that. On average, for every second slower the sprint is, the long jump distance decreases by 45.74 inches. And again, that's not a hard, fast rule. That's why I said on average, right? That's just my prediction. And then for the y-intercept, again, we have to do both the x and the y-intercept. The y-intercept in this case would be 414.79. And remember, that happens up high when the x value is actually zero, is when it hits the y-axis. So we could say, in theory, if you had a sprint time of zero seconds, right, Again, that's why I say in theory, that's not practical. Our line predicts a long jump, an LJ, of 414.79 inches. Again, not practical, but in theory, that's what our line would say. So that statement right there sort of proves that our line isn't really useful when you get to unrealistic sprint times, like zero seconds or two seconds or anything that's not humanly possible, for example. And the x-intercept isn't quite as obvious here. Remember, we've got to do a little bit of math for the x-intercept. But the x-intercept happens down here when the y value is zero. So all we've got to do is plug in zero for y, 
and solve for x to get our x-intercept. So for our x-intercept, we've got to do just a little bit of math. Plug in 0 for the y in our equation. And then let's solve for x. We should be at 9.07, approximately, for that x-intercept. And as far as the coordinate point, that would be 9.07, comma, 0. So let's interpret that. What does that mean? Well, x, that was our sprint time. So if you had a sprint time of 9.07 seconds, our line predicts that mm, you wouldn't have a long jump distance at all, right? Our line predicts a long jump of zero inches. Again, probably not reasonable. I know nine, seven, nine seconds is slow, but presumably you would still be able to jump some distance. So at the ends of our lines, I don't think it's very safe to make predictions. That's actually called extrapolating. But if you looked inside our line, anywhere between 5 and 7.5 seconds, I'd say we're safe in making predictions about long jump distance. So part D is actually a reasonable prediction. It says, predict a long jump distance for a student with a sprint time of 5.49 seconds. So we're going to plug 5.49 in for x. So there's our line. Instead of x, we've got 5.49. Substitute that in there. We should be looking at 163.68. That's what our line predicts for a student that would run 5.49 seconds. All right, let's go to the next page here. Measuring linear association. Um, and some of you have probably heard this before. Maybe you haven't. Uh, there's a special letter. It's called R. It stands for the correlation. You've probably heard that word as well. So it measures the strength and direction of the linear relationship between two variables. Okay, so what are the characteristics of this number? Well, it's a number that's always between negative 1 and positive 1. If your r is greater than 0, it means it's a positive association, similar to having a positive slope in a line. If it's less than 0, that would be a negative association. Values of r that are actually near 0, right? they're not close to 1 or negative 1, the endpoints there. If they're near 0, that indicates a nonlinear relationship. That's more of just a scattered pattern. We can't really see any linear relationship at all. And the next piece there, the strength of the linear relationship increases as r moves away from 0 towards the endpoint, being either 1 or negative 1. And when, once you get to those extreme values, the endpoints, 1 and negative 1, they would only happen if you had a perfect line. So if you have all these data points lining up exactly in a line, then you would get, if there's a positive slope, you get positive 1. If there's a negative slope, you would have negative 1 because the shape would make a perfect line line. So that's the idea of correlation, also known as the correlation coefficient. R is our variable for that one. And these diagrams, I know you don't have them in color, um, but you can see them here in the video in color. This is kind of get you acclimated to these values of R. So we said R that's equal to zero, so it's not positive or negative. That means the scatter plot doesn't really show any linear trend whatsoever. So we can't make one positive, we can't make one negative, we just don't see any linear trend. So if it's r equal to 0, that means there's no linear trend. The next one to the right here says r equals negative 0.3. Remember, negative 1 would be a perfect uh, linear trend in the negative direction. So negative 0.3, that means there's probably a really weak linear trend. And that's in the negative direction. So you'll notice I went ahead and drew an oval around this thing. Um, to me, the skinnier you can make this oval, that means it's kind of a strong uh, linear trend, or it's a tight grouping. So that value for r is going to be close to 1 or close to negative 1. So this one's a weak negative. If you look next one over, that's definitely a positive trend, right? You could imagine drawing a best fit line that would balance right through there, that would have a positive slope. And the oval would indeed be skinnier. So this is r equals 0.5. And a perfect positive correlation would say r equals 1. So this is, we would say, moderate positive association. I'm not going to call it weak. I'm not going to call it strong. It's moderate, right? It's 0.5. And then down here, bottom left, it says r equals negative 0.7. So this one, even stronger, even tighter grouping, skinnier oval. And we definitely see that it's negative. 
the 0.7 tells us it's tight grouping, and the negative tells us it's going in a negative direction. So we might say this is strong, and it's certainly negative. And then the next one, clearly positive, even tighter grouping. So we make the oval. 0.9, you could say that's strong or very strong, and that's certainly positive. And the last one, almost perfect, negative 0.99. Really tight grouping, really skinny oval. So this is almost perfectly linear, very strong, and it's in a negative direction. So just to give you an idea of how we measure the correlation with R, whether it's negative or positive, and what those values do when they approach 1 or negative 1, how the graph might look. All right, so if I could just move on here. Uh, example 2, find the correlation from example 1. What does this value by itself tell you about the relationship between sprint time and long jump distance? So our calculator didn't output the R value, but it actually can. We just need to put our settings, uh, actually turn the settings on for it to do that. So I want you to go to second, and then you can find anything under the catalog. So second, zero. Notice that's your catalog command. And I want you to go down, go down to diagnostic on. And all the commands should be in alphabetical order. So second, catalog, diagnostic, on. And then once you hit enter, you turn it on. Then once we do lin red, it'll actually output the R value too. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to second quit, a second mode right there, second mode. Just get back to my home screen. And then I said second catalog, all you have to do is hit the zero button, second catalog, and then just arrow down until you get to diagnostic on. Or if you want to use the alpha command, find D on your calculator, the letter D, and then diagnostic on. Oh, there it is. We want it on, not off. So let's select diagnostic on, hit enter, done. Wow, that's great. Now we just have to do lin reg one more time. So that was stat. And then let's go to calc, so arrow to calc, and then number four, lin reg. We actually want to use L1 and L2. And then let's go ahead and calculate. Wow, what do you know? There's our line, same thing, slope, y-intercept, and then there's r squared and r. And we want r, right? Ours is actually going to be negative 0.838. So we want that r value, not r squared, just r. Negative 0.838, let's round that and say negative 0.84. So our R value is negative 0.84. What does that tell us about the relationship? Without even looking at our scatter plot, what does that tell us about the relationship between sprint time and long jump distance? Well, a couple things. One, the negative tells us there's a negative trend or a negative association, right? And we actually saw that because as the sprint time went up, the long jump distance went down, meaning slower sprint time, shorter long jump distance. So the negative, that tells us there's a negative association. And the 0.84, hmm, that means there's some sort of strength there. So we could say there's a strong negative. And what kind of association is it? The shape of this thing is actually linear. So there's a strong negative linear relationship between sprint time and long jump distance. Why do I emphasize the linear? Because that's what R measures. It measures linear correlation. It doesn't, ma it doesn't measure if it looks like a parabola or any other figure. It measures uh, how well the thing fits in a line. So we have a strong 0.84. It's pretty close to, to 1. Negative, right? Linear relationship between sprint time and long jump distance. We can tell all that just by looking at that correlation value, R. All right, the real example two, how much is that truck worth? I'll let you read the setting. In general, the miles driven, the more you drive any vehicle, the less it's going to be worth, or the less you have to pay for it as far as the price goes. Are there a few exceptions? Sure. Here's the equation of the line. Interpret the slope in both intercepts of the regression lines. We should be getting pretty good at this by now. The slope is negative 0.1629. Again, it really helps if we can identify units for that. So let's go ahead and put that over 1. It's our slope. 
and the x value on bottom, I think that's miles driven, right? And then on top, that's actually the price in dollars. So on top we have dollars, and on bottom we have miles. That helps a ton when we have to interpret this thing. And how we read it, for each additional one mile, right? So for each additional mile driven, a truck's value depreciates by, I said about 16 cents. It'd be kind of weird to say uh, $0.1629. So about 16 cents. To be fair, we should also add a little comment here on average. On average. Rem again, that's not a hard, fast rule for every truck. We do have exceptions to that rule. That's just our prediction, right? That's just an average. All right, and since it's handy, it's right there. We're looking at it. Let's go with the y-intercept next. So that 38,257 piece. The important point to note here is when that's up high, right, it makes contact y-intercept, the x value is always 0. So we use that in our interpretation. When the x thing is 0, the y thing is this, right? Now we just got to give that statement some context. So we can say if it's 0 miles driven, right, that's like a new car. So how about this? The sticker price, which is the price on a new car, the sticker price on a new truck, meaning it has zero miles, is that y-intercept, $38,257 on average. Again, not all new trucks are the same price. This is just what our line predicts on average for a new truck. Again, zero miles driven for the x value. And then last but not least here, our x-intercept. We do got to do just a little bit of math for that one, right? We know when the x-intercept happens down here somewhere, that's the y value being 0. So we can solve for that by just plugging in 0 for our y. And we should get about 23,000, excuse me, 234,849.6. What's important about that? And again, that would be when the y value is 0. So our point, comma, 0. Well, if x is the miles driven, that means for a truck that's driven that many miles, almost a quarter million miles, by the way, for a truck that's driven that many miles, we pretty much say it doesn't have any market value at that point. The line predicts that it will no longer be of any value. And then part B, let's go ahead and look at part B. Predict the price of a Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4, so one of these trucks that's been driven 100,000 miles. Well, miles, that was our X variable, so we just grab our line and now we know what it's good for. Instead of X, I'm just gonna plug in 100,000. And we should be looking at 21,967, our prediction for one of these trucks it's got 100,000 miles. And then part C, let's estimate the correlation R for this association. We don't have the actual data, so we can't throw it in our calculator and have it calculate the exact value for R. So let's make an estimate. How tight is the grouping between all of these points? I can see the linear trend. I see that line. It's the best fit. It balances out between them. But as far as the grouping goes, again, I like to go ahead and draw the oval around it. Pretty skinny oval that looks like a relatively strong linear trend. So based on what we've seen today, how would we classify this trend? Again, this is just an estimate, so it doesn't have to be exactly correct. But for sure, we know the relationship's negative. Um, and I said moderately strong. So based on what we've seen with the diagrams, moderately strong, maybe about 0.75, and again, that's gotta be negative. Uh, if you said anything, you know, 0.55 to 0.8, there's no way I could mark you wrong because this is an estimate. This is just something you're observing based on what you know so far about correlation. So certainly negative, I think 0.75 is, is reasonable for something that looks like a moderately strong uh, linear trend. And again, that, that 0.75 number is coming from 
how tight the grouping is. All right, so you learned some calculator skills, you know what to do with scatter plots now, and you learned about correlation. That is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.